services to implementation. And we are actually located under the Korean Environment Institute, uh, which is um, the government funded uh, research institute under the Prime Minister's office. Um, today, um, actually, uh, we have a great, I think, a seminar, and I have called it a symposium, a seminar, the workshops. Uh, as Mitch, we, we see Mitch Green, which is mostly um, topics uh, from our side, uh, which is the environmental side and also the sustainable side. They actually towards um, the, the Green Deal, uh, which is uh, our Korean government is um, is tragically pushes and also challenges to our uh, new futures. Um, and also, most important topic is the ecologies. Um, you know, education science is a ecologies most 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 important area uh, to prepare our future climate change, especially uh, now we're looking at uh, nature-based solution, which is um, MBS. And under that, uh, our adaptation is policy is mostly likely into the EBA, which is the ecosystem-based adaptation policies. So, I mean, through these uh, the seminars, I, I guess I respect that there are two very important teaching about um, two sides of our ecology. So, I and also. Uh, some few remarks uh, right after the panel uh, discussion. Thank you very much, and congratulations on uh, Professor Gonzalez for this seminar. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for your remarks. Uh, without further ado, we now uh, proceed to introduce our next uh, speaker for today, uh, Dr. Oyun Sanja Suren. She's the, the Director of External Affairs of the Green Climate Fund, where she leads the fund's work on resource mobilization, partnerships, communication, and advocacy. Dr. Oyun served as the first president of the United Nations Environment Assembly, uh, the government body of the UN environment from 2014 to 2016, and has been an active advocate for sustainable development, climate change, and water security. She also served as a chair of the Global Water Partnership and also uh, an advisory board member of the Future Earth. Previously, uh, Oyun served consecutive terms as a member of the parliament in Mongolia, including as Minister of Environment, and Green Development and Minister of Foreign Affairs. She also, she also has as a foreign, so she's a founder of the Zori Foundation, a leading Mongolian NGO that advances democracy, social, and human rights and supports youth leadership and education. Dr. Sandy Zurin has a PhD in Air Science from the University of Cambridge. So without further ado, please enjoy me welcoming Dr. Sandy Zurin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, all. A great pleasure to be here with students, with professors, but also um, ambassador who visited the Green Climate Fund this morning as well with our colleagues. So um, many of you may or may not know that the Green Climate Fund, which is the largest now fund working with developing countries uh, to help them to leapfrog to greener, low carbon development and investments, is actually headquartered here in Songdong. Did you know that? Okay, very good. So we're just five minutes from here. And of course, uh, like young generation nowadays is very much aware and then also advocating, pushing for major transformation reforms in the how to tackle the climate change. And as you know, the next, this decade is absolutely key and essential because this decade coming from 2020, we have to have the emissions in the next, in this coming decade, then have in the decade afterwards, and by 2050, the whole world has to strive towards net zero carbon. And then very um, encouraged to hear about Korea's pledge by President Moon, that by 2050, also Korea will be um, striving to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. As you know, China announced at the end of September at the United Nations General Assembly, and that's also a major deal, by 2060, there will be aiming to achieve that, and China is, of course, currently the uh, largest emitter, although if you look at the accumulative historically, uh, other countries like the United States, and of course, Japan also announced net zero. So in our region in Asia, Northeast Asia, we have Japan, Korea, and China leading the world with uh, you know the, the political will, but of course, there is a major public and youth support for this. So it's very, very important. And 
Um, if we see, of course, the European Union already committed to net zero. If you add maybe United States, if they come with this commitment, then um, it's almost 70% of all the global emissions will be covered by that. So, you know, there was a lot of um, doubt whether the Paris Agreement, which was approved now five years ago, could be, uh, whether the targets could be met or not. But if some of these major economies, including Korea, are committing, if the US comes in, I think there is uh, some chance, and then everybody has to strive towards that. Cities, urban, is very, very important because, uh, you know, um, the 75%, and I'll give you some recent numbers, which you probably know because you have to pass the exams for this or something like this, but basically, um, by with sort of, you know, two thirds of the global population expected to reside in cities by 2050. And uh, by 2050, nearly, if you look at globally at all the infrastructure that is expected to be built around the world, nearly 75% by 2050, the new infrastructure to be built will be in the cities and yet to be built. So uh, how do we build cities? How do we also integrate ecosystems, nature, urban ecology into those solutions, into this investment is absolutely key. And um, uh, Green Climate Fund has been working now with more than 140 countries, all developing countries. And Korea is also one of the main contributors with GCF, same with the Netherlands, European, uh, many European countries, as well as Japan as well. And then we're, working with more than 100 what's called accredited entities to invest into greener, what's called low carbon climate resilient investments. That includes also cities, that includes also infrastructure in the cities and hopefully with the co-benefits for urban ecology and for ecosystems as well, for keeping the nature ecosystems as much as possible, um, also with the co-benefits as well. Now, um, I really would like you to also welcome to the GCF. It's not far away. So with COVID, it's not very easy, but we always welcome students to come and then we can present maybe not only about GCF, but explain to you what are the real projects there that we're supporting. And you're, even if you have your um, um, you know, academic papers, research, we're very happy to collaborate with you as well. So thanks very much all. Thank you, good luck. Thank you so much, Dr. Sanjay Suren, for your wonderful introduction about GCF and about the great important projects that you're doing. Now, please allow us two or three minutes to set up the presentation for our next speaker. So just in two or three minutes, we're going to be back. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your patience. Um, so now we have our third speaker of today, um, Mr. Doug Watkins. Uh, he was appointed as Chief Executive of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat in October 2019. Prior, uh, he has worked for over 30 years on the development and implementation of international initiatives for wetlands and water birds along the flyway. Mr. Watkins has represented several partners of the EAAFP in the past, such as the Australasian Weather Study Group, Wetlands International, uh, and Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna. Uh, he also was involved in very significant projects for the conservation of migratory water birds. During his time at the Wetlands International uh, Institution, uh, Mr. Watkins contributed, among other initiatives, to the development of the Asia Pacific Migratory Water Bird Conservation Strategy and the implementation of the Shore Bird Action Plans. He also led the development of the Wetland Management Guidance with Chinese wetland scientists. And now, with the review, please join me welcoming Mr. Watkins on the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, today, I'll, I just have a few slides explaining a bit more about the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership. So this is uh, this is a, a non-legal uh, initiative. So it's it's a partnership model, and it's a partnership model that brings together um, many different types of, of partners. Uh, the, the partnership was formed in two thousand and two, but it. Uh, this is like the second iteration of the partnership. So, um, so we have you know, more than 25 years experience in this, in this partnership. The, um, it's, 
links closely to the Ramsar Convention um, and it's recognised as a regional initiative under the Ramsar Convention. And the Secretariat here is hosted by Incheon Metropolitan Government and also the Ministry of Environment. And you can see from the shot, you know, these are the faces of the people that are involved in the Flyway Partnership. Uh, we, we try to meet every two years, but uh, COVID has beat us uh, for early next year. Um, but these are the people with the passion for uh, migratory birds and the wetlands that they, that they use. Our partners consist of national governments, of which we have uh, 18 involved so far. Um, we have the uh, intergovernmental organisations, the convention secretariats, which are also uh, part of the, of the partnership, a range of international NGOs um, and also IUCN. So this is the breadth of partners that are working uh, in country and internationally for uh, the conservation of migratory water birds and the wetlands that they use. The key work of the Flyway Partnership is building um, a network of internationally important sites. Um, to date, we have 148 sites involved in this network. Um, and these uh, aspire to be sustainably managed. In some cases, they are national protected areas. In, in other cases, they might not be. Um, the sites are nominated by national governments. Um, they seek to engage the local communities in, these, in the site to maintain the ecosystem services of these wetlands. Um, but we're only part way to uh, protecting or recognizing all of the internationally important sites as uh, it's estimated there are over a thousand internationally important sites in the flyway. And we like to keep reminding our national government partners in particular that we still have a long way to go. Perhaps you don't realize, but here in Songdo, um, there is a wetland of international importance. The tidal flats around the, the new city uh, and what was before the new city um, is internationally important for many migratory water birds particularly uh, on migration as they stage here before moving further south um, in, in the summer, in the winter. Uh, so the two um, blue areas you can see are parts of the Songdo Ramsar, uh, Ramsar site, and they're also uh, nominated as part of the Flyway Network site. So right here, um, you know, if you look outside uh, the, the residential and the, the uh, the business areas uh, on the mud flats, um, you are amongst, a, you are at our internationally important sites for migratory water birds. Also here, there is Namdong Reservoir, which, uh, which is, uh, if, uh, which is a, a basin which holds the storm water running off from the, the urban area. And this artificial site um, is now one of the one of the largest boombill set black faced boombill breeding sites in the world. And you can see the two islands uh, in the middle of the of the reservoir. And these have been constructed by Inchon government to provide habitat for spoonbill sandpipers, black faced spoonbills to uh, to nest on. Um, and uh, in some years there are several hundred black faced spoonbills coming to breed uh, um, in Namdong Reservoir. Um, this is a shot of the, oh, you can see the, the spoonbills across this, uh, the small island. Um, as yet, they haven't moved across to breeding on the larger island, um, but hopefully that will, will happen in the future. Uh, further south of here um, is, is Chonsu Bay, um, and this is one of another site in the, the flyway uh, site network. Um, this, uh, area or the northern parts of Chonsu Bay were reclaimed uh, several decades ago. Um, but increasingly the local community recognizes that the loss of the fishery is, is a major, um, has been a major impact of the reclamation. So whilst the reclamation has provided additional areas for rice fields and many migratory water birds come to feed in these rice fields after, after harvest, um, there is a, a strong interest in, in some restoration of the water bodies that are still in the center um, of, uh, of the site. 
Um, some weeks ago, there was an international uh, restoration workshop um, um, ha held in this area to really uh, move forward planning about how to, how to uh, restore the health of particularly the water bodies um, in this area. And um, I anticipate and I hope that the local government will, uh, will include this in, in their suggestions about what can be done in Korean Green New Deal. Um, and it uh, sets some precedent and some develops some practices about how some of these reclaimed areas could have uh, some of the values, particularly related to the water bodies, uh, restored and, and to uh, enable local communities to recommence uh, the fisheries activities in these areas. Um, it's proposed for the, uh, the one to the west um, to initially start activities uh, in, in this area. Uh, when we visited it a few weeks ago, the water was bright green <laughs> because all of the nutrients come in and, and, and sit in this area. So uh, really it has extremely low um, health at the moment um, and there are you know, major changes needed to how the, how the, uh, the water is managed um, in these areas. So that's my uh, very quick presentation to show you that um, international important sites are here in the city uh, and are present in, in a number of our flyway network sites, which are, uh, for example, in Tokyo Bay in Japan and Osaka uh, in Australia, in, in, uh, in Hong Kong. So often um, areas of major biodiversity importance are associated with cities. It's just that we don't recognise it. We, we don't see what, uh, what's in front of us. Um, and uh, I hope through the, the, the Green New Deal that there will be some opportunities to uh, enhance some of these uh, important wetlands. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Watkins. Uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful presentation, opening our eyes on what uh, urban wetlands actually mean, uh, especially being here in a uh, in reclaimed land. And uh, definitely, you know, it's something that we could have the chance to discuss uh, a little bit further in the panel discussion. So, uh, really appreciate your presentation. Um, so now, uh, for another very special uh, guest speaker today. Um, we have the um, opportunity uh, to welcome uh, Her Excellency uh, Ambassador uh, Joan Dornevar from the Netherlands. Uh, before uh, we welcome her, let me just tell you, uh, as uh, you know, a very unique uh, aspect of her profile is uh, she's not only a high-ranked diplomat but also a landscape architect. So, <laughs> being myself from that uh, you know architecture field and urbanism field, I feel uh, you know very um, honored to to welcome uh, our um, the ambassador to this I guess, speaker. So now, without further ado, uh, please uh, welcome me to join Ambassador of the Netherlands, uh, Joan Joan Donnevar. Thank you so much. Um, so there you see the color orange. Orange, that's a little bit the color of the Netherlands. And you can see the, the orange troops, that's really the fans of uh, Dutch soccer. Um, I don't know if you know where the color orange comes from. It's the house of orange. Our king comes from the family. A villain from Oranje, so orange. That, that's, so we made that our national color. Um, so good afternoon, my name is Joanna Donner, I'm the ambassador of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, I've been here one year in Korea, and uh, I think it's, it's perfect timing to be here at this side of the world to see the changes that are taking place very fast. Uh, I'm here this afternoon to share with you what we went through in the Netherlands. Um, let me just show you a little bit where we are. Um, does it work? Yeah. So the Netherlands, we are a small country uh, in Western Europe. We have neighbors around us, lots of water, the seaside, um, Germany, Belgium, south of us, the UK across the uh, North Sea, Sweden, Denmark, it's all around us. Um, we have a special relationship with Korea. Uh, I know you might know Mr. Hamel, uh, he was there, I think, in the 17th century. But also the Korean War, 
I mean, the Dutch were part of the sending states. We sent more than 5,000 soldiers here at that time, liberating, helping liberating uh, South Korea. Oh, look at that. Okay, Netherlands. Should I do something more? Okay, oh, now these are the, just some figures that you might know. Do you know who this is? I think the elders don't know. <laughs> there are some Dutch figures here that have uh, that are known here in, in Korea. So who's sitting here was here at uh, coach of the national team. These two, we're very proud, are king and queen, Willem Alexander and uh, Queen Maxima. Don't know if this thing is a bell. This is the Nachtwacht, uh, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, you might know. This is the girl with the earrings. I mean, I'm wearing right now one, this is very popular. Uh, that's uh, one of the painters of Vermeer. Uh, Anne Frank, some of you might have uh, read her diary. And um, this is Hendrik Hamel, the one who washed the shore here in the 17th century. And he has a little statue in the Netherlands, reminding of that fact. And this is Walter Hamel. I think he's a songwriter here, and you might know him as well. Uh, so that's uh, just some figures of the Netherlands. Then another few figures, I'll get to the climate later on, but just to remind you what we stand for. <laughs> uh, the tulips, the windmills, uh, ice skating. I can tell you we have this uh, 11 city tour that we used to skate in the winter time that connects 11 little towns in the north of our country. Uh, so you would skate from one village to another on the, on the lakes and on the little canals. I think the latest one is more than 10 years ago because our winters are not that cold enough anymore. Um, but these are just the cool old, good old times that we could skate on the lakes. Uh, this is our prime minister riding a bike. I'll get back to that later. We love riding our bike and um, we all do also the prime minister. Picture of Amsterdam. Oh, and the, and the wooden shoes that we don't wear anymore, but they're nice souvenirs. Um, this is the map of the Netherlands. I mean, the Netherlands, it means nether, it's, it's mean uh, lowlands. A third of our country is below sea level. We have always struggled with water. So that makes us also, we think, very good water management. Um, we are a small country. We are just 17 million inhabitants, very densely populated. Uh, everywhere there's water. Um, so we learned at a very early age, as part of our curriculum, to swim. Um, so our economy is really also concentrated in the West. Um, like Schiphol Airport is seven meters below sea level. Uh, and it's very flat, we don't have any mountains. Um, that gives you a little bit of an idea and also why for us climate change is such an important subject. We already grow up about the struggle of, with water. Um, and rising sea levels, we have our dikes protecting our country from, from, from the water coming in. But we also realize that now we cannot go on constructing and constructing and constructing higher and higher. So we have to do something about that. So one of them is like international cooperation, trying to fight climate change together. We cannot not do that, just do that by ourselves. And, and it's very good that we have right now all these international arrangements that we fight together for, uh, um, for a better climate. Um, but also, um, so that's mitigation, but there's also adaptation because we know it will take some time and we cannot go on. So right now we do a lot of adaptation, uh, resilient measures that we take in the Netherlands, like big cities like Rotterdam, right now they have parks. I, I don't have pictures of that, but it really that the water can come in without having much of uh, uh, hazard or uh, disturbances. We, we just can have the water in temporarily till it goes down again without uh, much of uh, destruction or, or damage. And that's really a new way of planning that has come up for the last 10 years right now. But the importance of climate change, that's very well uh, noticed in the moment. And also the realization that we have to work together to fight that. So we came to a climate arrangement, and that's what my talk will be about, that I just want to share with you how we came there. 
So we agreed that um, we want to bring down our CO2 emissions 49% in 2030 and 95% in 2050, and we want to phase out our coal-fired power plants by 2030. And all in a way that it's affordable for everybody, it should be fair, it should be, and it should be feasible. And then, okay, how to get to that? Um, for that, we designed uh, the climate consultation group. So we, we uh, had climate tables on certain sectors, it shows here. So we had agriculture, we had the electricity sector, we had the built environment, uh, mobility and the industry. And they had their own tables. And at these tables, the stakeholders would be sitting together. It took more than a year and a half to come to an agreement on how to uh, reach those uh, reductions in the CO2 emission. And they sat together, I mean, and the people selected for these stakeholders. So the criteria were that they really had a role to play in reducing the emissions, or they could enhance societal support for these measures. The other group would be that they would have knowledge and expertise in that sector and how to reduce it. So the Knowledge Institute would be there at the table as well. And there should be at the table the persons who could have a mandate to make the deals. So that could be local government, provincial government, whatever. So they were sitting together at the table trying to reach an agreement how to, within their sector, to reduce the CO2 emissions. And that went step by step. As I mentioned, it took quite some time. So they make a kind of package and then we had our Bureau for Statistics to calculate. So what they, the ideas that they had, would it work? And what would it cost society? And then sometimes it would work, but at a certain point it was too expensive or it did not reach the, the target that they had set themselves. So then it had to go back to the table and discuss, okay, what other measures are possible? So it went back and forth, but in the end, every table had an agreement on how to, to reach that goal. And that was sent to Parliament and accepted. So this is just a, a picture of one of those tables, um, having a, a table for the industry. So it would, would come with uh, industrial clusters from uh, the, the chemical cluster. Um, there would be somebody from the national government, the local government, the labor unions would be there, the NGOs. They would all sit together. So when you have an agreement that comes out of that, that has been calculated, uh, then you also get a, a ownership. So people accept it and they all sign. So it's not really legislation, it's an agreement that all the parties put their signature on. And this is what it, uh, so this is the total package. So here you can see uh, on agriculture, it has a lot, I mean, we are a very big producer, exporter of agriculture products. We are a small country, but we are the second largest exporter of uh, flowers, uh, vegetables, everything related to agriculture. So that is a big burden. And I mean, the sector the sector together, okay, what can we do to have sustainable heating in those greenhouses? What would be an uh, improved uh, manner to, to on the manure to reduce the emissions? Um, storage of carbon. So they went through a whole lot of measures and, uh, and they came up with solutions. The built environment, um, how can you insulate your houses? Um, what kind of, um, so we switch, we have natural gas in the Netherlands, but we have decided right now, we will not use our natural gas, we will use renewables. So what is needed? I mean, the new buildings, you can already do that, but how do you adapt the old buildings? Um, so the, the, a lot of measures have been taken and calculated and the government came up with the money to, to, to make that work. Uh, industry, mobility and electricity. So they all had their own, uh, own measures and I can just go in one of the electricity. So they agreed on phasing out the coal-fired electricity or power. 2030, the first one already closed. But it also came with a package because I know here in, in Korea it's the same. I mean, if you close your coal-fired power plants and you might have renewables, what are you going to do with the labor? What are you going to do with the people? So you also have to think and take into account what, what do it mean? Do, they, do I have to re-educate the people? What kind of process? So you have to set money aside and the whole process to, 
to help those people uh, or guide them in a, in a new way of, uh, of profession. And it already shows that there's a lot of jobs are possible in renewables. I mean, right now we can really see it's not a cost, it's really an opportunity. And that's something that we also like to, to, to make clear to, to Korea. Uh, we accelerated offshore wind power. Right now, if you fly to the Netherlands to Schiphol Airport and you will make the road usually the planes on the North Sea, you will see huge, immense offshore wind park. Because in the beginning, we had some people onshore. We are densely populated, so people would be very upset to have this big windmill uh, making noise in the backyard. And, and offshore is, uh, yeah, that's easy. Nobody's protesting. Well, it seemed that nobody was protesting. But then we had horizon pollution, we call that. So they have to be at least 10 kilometers out of the shoreline. And then we had, of course, some discussions with uh, migratory birds, because these are also the, the routes that they take. So that had to be taken into account as well. But I think a solution was reached that right now um, that, that all could be accommodated. Uh, and this gives uh, a picture of what, what in the mobility sector will be done. Um, well, the big thing is that as of 2030, you cannot buy a car anymore in the Netherlands that has uh, carbon emissions. So it's 2030, it should be either hydrogen or it should be electricity. And that's in 10 years' time. So what are we going to do? And then right now, then you can see the market, what it will bring, because, I mean, we're going to build, we already have charging stations right now, but that will increase to 1.8 million charging stations. And it's the private sector who will, who's stepping in there. They're making a lot of money right now, because, I mean, the, the government is very clear where we want to go, and then the investors and the banks, they come in, and they're willing to invest, and then it pays for itself, almost. Uh, and then, of course, the bicycles. I mean, we are a country, it's flat. Uh, we are already used to riding our bikes, and that's even more promoted with more bike lanes. Uh, we have even highways for bikes, so that you'll have for some longer distances. A green flow, the traffic light will be on green, you will not be standing in the, in the wind. Cold. No, I mean, there will be a green flow. The person in the car has to wait, and you can go. So really, the bikes is being promoted, and you have the right of way, so everything is being done a lot to promote bike riding. And that uh, right now the, the number of lanes, um, so the cars are really being pushed out of the city again. And that's something that you see after COVID-19, also happening in Paris and, and a lot of other cities that did not have such a strong bike uh, tradition, but that's happening right now. Just close one car lane and, and make it into a bike lane and people would, would just take the bike because it's nice to take your bike. Good exercise saves a lot of money also for the uh, health because the condition will be better. It's good for your, the pollution in your city and people usually are much more happy when they can just ride their bike. Um, so that's the model shift to, uh, to bicycles. And um, yeah, a lot of also smart uh, solutions that uh, came up. This is a picture of uh, energy efficiency, how we try to reach that. So 1.5 million homes and utility buildings to be really energy efficient. Um, we do start energy tax system for that. And really the municipalities are taking the lead in that. So they really um, unite the people together. So there's subsidy for that. If you're willing, your house is there. What does it cost? You can submit um, for solar panels or you want to do another system for your electricity. Um, usually there's a lot of uh, support from the local government to make that switch to more uh, renewables. Yeah, then I come to the end of my, my presentation. Um, but I think it's very important to have this transformation to a more sustainable society. It really starts with uh, education and awareness. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's so important. I mean, this is the future of the, of the youth. It's your future right now. Um, that we should try to take care of, that you can live in a healthy environment and we should take care that we don't spoil it. Um, and it's, it's good to, that I can see it, what happened in the Netherlands that because of education, the children ask their parents, we want to recycle and why are you driving a car? So because they learned about the, the common goods, about the healthy climate, climate change. And that really helped to convince the parents to explain, okay, why do you do that? And okay, do I really need a car or can I take the bus or can I take my bike? 
So that discussion is really important for society, I think. And then they participate because then they buy uh, ecological uh, responsible goods. They want to invest in things that are sustainable. Right now, our public pension fund, they have withdrawn millions of dollars or euros from Capco here because they said it's not sustainable. And the consumers, so you see that right now financial institutions are asking for a sustainable way of production. Otherwise, they will just withdraw their finance. And that, I think that that's such a major thing to, uh, even if they're not willing, because that, that comes bottom up. I mean, society is asking for this change. And that's really helpful also for government in the end to have the legislation to support that and to give the, the, the industry, the companies, uh, the target and to be sure that the policy will really go that way because that's right now what companies are asking for. Indeed, such a uh, target as in 2030 or 2050 to be uh, net zero. That's something, okay, how are you going to do that? How are you increasing your renewables? That's very important for uh, companies to invest money in new technologies, but they have to be sure that in 10 years time, if there's another government, it should be the same. So that's also the role of government, but it, it also starts with society asking for these changes. I think that concludes my, oh no, that's the little things that you can already do. Ride your bike. I think this city here, you have the possibility, it's flat. I tried to ride my bike in Seoul, it's not always easy. <laughs> but here you have bike lanes, I saw, that's why it's recycling. Look at your energy bill, can you, what can you do to insulate, uh, make use of renewables. These, all these little things add up also, I think, to, uh, to help uh, fight climate change. I think that's my, I come to the end of my presentation. I don't know if there are any questions. But that's, oh, uh, if they want to. I don't know if I can answer them. But sure, yeah, we have time for questions. Any, any comments, questions from the audience here or on Zoom? Uh, we have like, uh, Okay. Yeah. So, the energy, is it oh. so we, we have, sorry, sorry, we have some mics, uh, if hopefully it works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's very impressive. So uh, for energy, the target was 70% electricity generation by renewables, right, by 2030, yeah. and no, no, no coal power plant. So the chasing out of the 30% difference, is it sort of remaining coal plants, or is it the uh, hydro? Okay, no. A hydro is, is an important one that comes in later on. Um, and uh, we still have gas-fired power plants, but that also has to be phased out. We have biomass, okay. uh, but we realize it takes time. But the coal-fired power plants right now, the first one is already, although they have a longer lifetime, they're already being closed. Okay. Yeah. No new and then close everything. Yeah, so no new, that's for sure. And we have also um, no nuclear. Right. So we, we try to, to find, and, and offshore wind is really something that in the beginning we had to, it was very costly and very expensive, and the government really had to step in. And right now it pays for itself. It really is because, I mean, with economies of scale, uh, new uh, technologies, uh, and indeed, I mean, there's uh, an electricity price, but it's worth, I mean, right now, we, we hardly have to, to subsidize that. So they just have to hand out the, the plots and the requirements, but then the, the private sector steps in. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Any other? Okay, well, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, if I may add to, to your comment about Sunda, I actually was thinking we are living in a little mini Netherlands here. Uh, I mean, we are also surrounded by water, uh, it's very flattish. And actually, myself, I try to run my bicycle as much as I can. Uh, so, hopefully, we will, I don't know, get some input on how to you know, become more bicycle friendly. We have the bike lanes all around the city. Uh, so it's just a matter of, uh, you know, make people more interested about it. Oh, yes, yeah, please, could we just... Because there's one thing that... Uh, oh, should we bring it? 
Oh, oh yeah, yes, go ahead. Please. <laughs> on, the, on the bikes, there's something, I mean, I've been right now four years uh, abroad, but that happened very fast. We used to have, uh, so we have lots of bikes in the Netherlands, there are more bikes than people. Um, you have usually a bike to go, a very old one that sometimes gets stolen, you to go to the railway station, another one really for recreation. And one when you have little kids that you need to put a lot of kids on the bike. <laughs> Uh, but lately, I mean, we had also e-bikes, uh, electric bikes, for, and usually they were for elderly people who didn't have. But right now we have these design bikes, and they're really hype. And I think that would go very well here in Korea as well. They're very expensive, but they're really, very, very, good, very cool. And uh, you have to insure them because. <laughs> they, uh, but they are fast, and they are the latest materials. You cannot see that they're electric because it's in the frame. It's really high tech. And there you can go just very smoothly, although there's wind, it doesn't matter, you just go. And uh, and that really also stimulates people to, to ride a bike, because then the wind or the, the hill is not an excuse, because with the e-bike you can do it as well. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you again. Thank you. Definitely have uh, a lot of things uh, to learn from the Netherlands. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Uh, a very comprehensive vision on, on the whole you know, approach of the country. So, um, well, thank you all uh, who have been uh, joining uh, up until now. Uh, please allow us a couple of minutes to set up the stage for our next uh, session, which will include a presentation of our urban ecology program by uh, our professor, uh, Russell Assen, uh, as well as our some of our students uh, who will present some of the things they have been working on. Uh, so uh, again, thank you so much, and please come back in about two or three minutes, okay? Two or three minutes, we'll be back here. Thank you. Okay, welcome back, uh, everyone. Thank you for uh, your patience and uh, for remaining with us today. Uh, so as discussed before the little break, um, we are going to have uh, the next section of our event today, which will be an introduction of our urban ecology program. Um, as well as uh, some presentation by uh, some of our students. They have been working on uh, you know, analyzing some of the um, projects affecting this post-pandemic reality and from the perspective of urban ecology. So without further ado, uh, please uh, join me welcoming Professor Redul Assam from the Urban Ecology Department of the University of the Asia Campus. Thank you so very much, Alvaro, and I'm really thankful to Onsu, Alvaro, and some bright faces of my students here. These things is only possible because of them. And this, I'm Dr. Yazul Hassan, as Alvaro said, I'm, I met with all the guests up here today. This, from GCF, from Australian Fly, or the Austrian, I'm sorry, with this one, the Netherlands Ambassador, and the Environmental Ministry. How am I matching with this one? because my ethnicity is Bangladesh. I'm origin from Bangladesh, right? GCF have a big fund because of the climate change. By citizen, I'm an Australian, where you are having a big program on this one in New South Wales, where I live. And then since the childhood you grew up, seeing Ruth Gullet, you may not know, one of the famous Dutch soccer player. However, since I'm in here in Korea, it has always been a challenge for me to say what is urban ecology is. It's not totally urban planning. It's not ecological science. Every time it takes what is urban, but it is the connectivity with the physical and natural environment with our built environment. Just to take an example, like climate change is not an individual phenomenon, or COVID-19 is not an individual phenomenon, but they are connected with our whole of natural system, environmental system, and urban system. And that's something we learn here that's something we practice here, and that's something my students are going to present to you today. So I'm not being taking this stage anymore. Let my students take over it because they are the future. I am not. Thank you, guys. Please welcome here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lindsay Han, who is studying urban ecology at the University of Utah Asia campus. Urban ecology is a discipline where we learn and practice to address contemporary global challenges in the urban context with the environment and ecological perspective. To reflect our training thoughts and ideas, I and my fellow students from urban ecology department are addressing 
two most two most contemporary challenges that Korea is facing and how they could be addressed in Korean Green New Deal. The first challenge is climate change and world crisis. And the second challenge is post-pandemic impact on urban system. My peers will give you more details by presenting our research, research work titled Smart City Approach to Address cl Climate-Induced Water Crisis and Post-Pandemic Approach to Manage Urban System. Thank you. Hi. So, <clears throat> In last hundred years, the average temperature in South Korea rose up to 1.8 degrees. If no further efforts are made to combat climate change, it will rise up to 4.7 degrees by end of the 21st century. This will have a direct impact on our fresh water supply. Even the average precipitation is 1.6 times greater than the world average due to geographical situation and concentrated rainfall in the summer makes hard to control the water supply. This would be a dire consequence and most difficult upcoming environmental such as flood and drought and social challenges for South Korea to date. Smart approach and technological advancement could be a second option to overcome such climate-induced water crisis. Our project is about how the smart city approach could address upcoming climate challenges. So there are smart approaches that would be easily um, applicable and can be um, practiced in smart city contexts, such as some need to be more sensitive to water and minimize climate-induced water prices pressure. For example, spawn city, where city would act as a sponge and rain rainwater harvest to minimize the load on fresh groundwater. At the same time, green roofing a smart build, um, building design can meet the needs of local water demand. The, green, the new Green Deal needs to be proactive and address smart technology-based solutions as an alternative to address upcoming climate challenges for South Korea. So this is the second post about post-pandemic approach to manage urban system. So South Korea is one of the highly dense and urbanized countries in the world. Its high density has severe health impacts and the COVID-19 pandemic is a real example. At the early stage of pandemic in China, South Korea started being highly exposed to the COVID-19 that not only caused that, but also changed the whole of the urban economy and system. Public transport, the backbone of the urban economy gets highly affected and is still considered as one of the key sources to spread the virus. And second, the significance of urban park was raised as a, pl raised as a place for outdoor activity for people who are suffering the depression from this pandemic situation. Also, social distancing brought the positive effect of reducing air pollution in the urban area. Our project is to rethink about the urban system after the pandemic when we used global examples to learn, compare, and implement. So over the past uh, decades, South Korea was achieving remarkable economic growth. But as soon as the COVID-19 struck to the country, the growth of the economics started to slow down. Emphasizing the necessity of a rapid change, on July 14th, the Korean government finalized and announced the Korean New Deal. This is a uh, national project to revive the economic from the COVID-19 incident. It generally aims to minimize the economic loss and lead the global community that adapts, uh, that adapts structural changes. 
The Korean New Deal contains three policies, which are Digital New Deal, Green New Deal, and Stronger Safety Net. So based on these three policies, the Korean government will manage total 28 projects and invest about 106 trillion won. As we all know that COVID-19 is a pandemic as a global threat, we therefore we need to look from the global context and need to localize the global practice. Keeping that in mind, we introduce some global examples uh, like Singapore, Milan, and London to evaluate their urban management system and as a post pandemic situation. By analyzing the, their pros and cons, we could learn from their actions and see how the lesson could be embodied with the Green New Deal to achieve a better, healthy environment for the future of South Korea. Thank you for listening. Thank you, team. This has been great. I'm so proud of you guys. And that's what really we are all looking for the future. But when the global things are being challenged, challenged not in for only South Korea, it's been challenged for all over the world. And at the right moment of time, the South Korean government introduced the new Green Deal. And this has become a hot topic or a futuristic topic to think and to look around how far it could go. How far you could go to meet the challenge of climate? How far you could go to meet the COVID-19 or the second pandemic or something else coming up in our pathway? And that's what we are learning here in urban ecology. Maybe my students today, they are featuring the nearest future and next student, they will be focused on the further future. And that's how together we can make it better tomorrow. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, and thank you to all your students. I mean, you guys have been doing yeah, yeah, you have been <laughs> you have been doing a great work. And uh, I'm pretty impressed, you know, uh, about your presentation today. So um, again, thank you for raising those topics, uh, which are you know really um, emergent, I think. So now um, we're gonna have a little break of about maybe three to five minutes to set up uh, our stage for the panel discussion in which we will have um, Dr. Hong Chan and um, so Don Watkins um, exchanging uh, impressions about um, the remarks that have been made uh, earlier on today, as well as about maybe the students, uh, you know, uh, highlights as well. So uh, please uh, come back uh, with us in about three to five minutes. Okay, thank you. All right, welcome back. Um, thank you for your patience and for been here with us. Uh, so now this is the third section of our uh, event today. And as you can see, we have um, two of our uh, guest speakers as uh, panelists uh, today. So um, we're gonna briefly discuss about um, some of the issues that have been raised uh, during the presentations of the speakers before. We will also really encourage all our audience, both in Zoom and here uh, on site, to ask questions, because this is supposed to be uh, more active uh, in kind of setting. Uh, so both of our uh, speakers have uh, kindly agreed to receive questions and comments from the audience. So uh, perhaps I can just uh, start by asking what are your general thoughts of um, today's um, remarks? Uh, we've been going through you know, a series of remarks, uh, not only yourselves, but also the ones from the, the ambassador of the Netherlands and as well as uh, the ones from Dr. Sanjay Sura from Green Climate Fund. And also the students' um, you know, brief presentation on, on their projects. So may I be very, very general on my first question. What do you guys think about today's event? What do you think about the topics that have been so far raised? Please. Okay. Anyone. <laughs> you can use your mic. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I felt it was a very, uh, a very uh, interesting session, and um, it's good to see some light presentations for a change. Um, often presentations has got so much information in it; it's very difficult to to absorb all of that information. But I think today they were they were nice and light, um, and people uh, presenters were highlighting some of the the issues that relate to approaching a Green New Deal or approaching the issues 
both of the carbon story um, and you know hopefully biodiversity story um, as well. Um, I was particularly interested to hear about issues with potential water supply uh, in the future. Um, and so I'm going to ask a question about it. Coming from Australia, um, I'm very familiar with the issues of water supply because Australia is such a dry country. Um, and am I right in thinking that the issue is the, the storage of water and that the storage of water will become a bigger problem in the future um, because it will rainfall decrease um, and evaporation perhaps increase. Um, but is the issue really about storage of water? Yep, thank you. Is it? So, so that's my, my oh. question about whether the, the problem uh, about the water issue is to do is, is that Korea's reservoirs are limited in their ability to store the water. And so the problem is about storage of water um, for the dry periods of the year. Is, is, is that the nature of the problem? Uh, good question. <laughs> yes, I... Please, okay. yeah, we, have, we have some microphone for you there. Yep. So, well, thank you so very much. And I'm also from Australia. Australia, as you said, is a dry country. And I'm from South Australia, which is the, I'm the dry state of So that's the driest part of the world. So I can tell you a little story that in South Australia during the summer, they don't allow us to garden because the water crisis is that much. If we wash your car in your car waiting home, you never call the police. And then these guys doing a stupid job, staying water. That's how we grow up in South Australia. And that's the, since we are here, as this is my concern, how water is a crisis for Korea. And then during my students and I were doing the research, the geological location and geographical location of South, South Korea is this, one side is the land boundary, but the other three sides is completely seawater. So groundwater of the freshwater level is really low. The freshwater is a still salty water. And the only source of freshwater they're getting is coming from home and which has some political boundaries given my capacity of measuring, but the other source is on the rainwater. The seawater they can use it by uh desalination plant, which is very expensive. Those so of Korea has some desalination plant. So they are only measuring the rainwater reservoir. However, uh, you can add something when we are doing some of my research. That is not any policy or any strategy is how to harvest the rainwater in South Korea. And that's why like you might find the vegetables here are quite expensive. The season is the groundwater is very low, and the farmers have to pay a lot for the groundwater, and that costs the vegetables price here is so expensive. And, then, and that is like that they don't have, they have reservoir, but that reservoir is not connected to the sea. So the freshwater supply is very limited. That's what we found in our research and also present in the, and top of that, the climate change, precipitation level that causes the extra volume of the freshwater supply. And then we have to start thinking how smart technologies could be a solution. Because we have all the high risk buildings, especially in South. Why don't we make those houses as a greenhouse? Green design because then the rainwater can be easily harvested. And at the same time, we can have a smart image to monitor the water consumption. So we can reduce the water, fresh water dependency. We can use the grey water treatment plant. And it will surprise you, it is very interesting when I found the water we use in the toilet here for flushing is the drinking water. Can you imagine that the water we use for washing our clothes in the washing machine is drinking water, fresh water. We take it, but let's say, can a smart technology could solve it? Because we don't need the drinking water for washing or washing our clothes or washing the cars. Because that's how I grew up in South Australia. Like, be careful, don't use that one. Drinking water is only drinking water. So that's what we're trying. But South Korea is still in that challenge. Maybe they're not in that. I'm in a stage, but the day is not very far. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, um, so, yeah, definitely, the water is um, a big issue globally. But, you know, the case of Korea, I, I believe that um, 
we we need to understand better in order to uh, kind of approach this green new deal with more sense. Um, obviously, perhaps green infrastructure is a topic that Dr. Chang knows a little bit. Uh, uh, and also, like you know, the way in which adaptation strategies um, you know, can imply the use of water, either waste uh, water management, uh, water reuse, um, you know, water cleaner, and that kind of um, aspects. Well, thank you, Professor Gonzalez. Um, that's actually a very difficult question for me to <laughs> address. Uh, but um, uh, first of all. Um, now I understand why you I and mean, Paul and I this uh, <laughs> seminar in this way. Um, like I, well, well, I'm from like a most like in government side, huh? and the next like the global finance from GCF, and then uh, it's coming like into partnerships, which was like in the NGOs work, and then goes down to the international network. So we try to look at some of the different sides. You know, View about this and then you on the green deal and the first pandemic. And also, I have very impressions work, uh, work from um, the student, right? Yes, uh, yes. And then, uh, very impressive. Uh, and uh, we have to actually invite some of people to uh, to tell us and uh, invite the lectures or invite us and presentation from your work. So, thank you very much for the being here uh, the inviting me here. And then, and before I'm making uh, some of um, answers uh, from the you water know, resources, um, I'm, I'm actually many people understand about you know, what the climate change is. Uh, I live in probably multiple and think about what is climate change. And our center is actually mostly related to the work by the climate change adaptation. And I also most of all probably understand about the adaptation. Um, but um, you know, the definition of human activity uh, of adaptation is you know, all of work to adjust our economic and our social, even ecological system um, to, to in response to the actual or expected impact, or mostly the negative impacts, um, um, to, 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 uh, uh, to buy content. So the, all the actions and the work was is also we treat it as the climate adaptation of the work. But I suppose you think that oh this is you know education, this is such a matter of no. But if and I mean if it's related to, to climate change responses, we think that is adaptation. Um, I might have a very broader you know, definition about climate adaptation, but our government should be you know, have you know a broader uh, definition of adaptation because now I mean even though I'm work, uh, closely working with the Ministry of Environment, they have really narrow uh, the definition of adaptations. That's the only to be our uh, I would say deciding or uh, you know discussing about you know what the um, actual definition about um, adaptation. So anyway. Um, so we're looking at these words. Um, maybe, maybe and this is from the history of work. So it's not deep enough we can take. But still, uh, we think um, as this one is very creative um, ideas. Um, some of um, um, things uh, you suggested we we already have. Uh, we already implemented in some of um, local areas and some of the local cities. Already, uh, like some of the things. Uh, well, first of all, uh, for example, um, uh, the green roof systems and also the green water filtrations. We already doing that, but I mean, I'm not saying that. I mean, this is useless, but I'm saying that okay, we only doing this one, but still looking for like a you know a more adaptive way and a more creative way to implement it. Because we or we have to uh, transform to adapt or reach climate change. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm also from uh, from actually urban area. Um, I did my PhD in city and regional planning, and my research is mostly focused on sustainable urban area. And also now I'm doing climate ad uh, adaptive adaptation area. So I myself I mean, described it as a, like a, okay now I'm. Sustainable climate 
urban <laughs> something <laughs> yeah it's very complicated but anyway um, um, uh, am I saying just in a few comments about this one about the response city? Uh, this is actually a new challenge, especially for urban people, because uh, when you do um, some policies about the urban area, uh, we like a uh, I don't know, um, maybe that we, we made some kind of different class of entities. Okay, these policies going to the citizen level or community level. Or the city levels. But right now, it's like a most of, um, I mean, even like after 21st centuries, you know, now we think that uh, the city, one city as a kind of one entity. But the, what kind of the city can do in energy science? Some, some of research actually, actually suggested that you know, why do we, why, why shouldn't we use a city as a, like a battery for the energies? So um, the, some city has stored energies and distributes the others. City needs more energy. And this part is all the same, the same concept. Okay, one city can observe the, all the world resources and maybe just can even share some of the, I mean, the excessive resources to other cities. But we need some kind of distribution systems. We use very similar uh, system to in the electric city distribution systems, like you know, microgrid systems. They, they, they produce uh, a lot of electricity in a uh, very small quantity, and they build a distribution system. So, but that entity could be small, but in the higher uh, the class of our resources, like uh, the water and the other things, like the ecological resources. Uh, we not think as a different uh, way of thinking, which is city as a one entity. And a part of citizens could be the one of the sub entity, but still, the city is kind of uh, uh, the one entity with produce some of the policies and the thinking policies. So I think that this policy is a very interesting concept. There's our Korean government uh, pushes um, the one of the things like the LID, which means a low impact development. And also, it's very closely related to the LED, which is low emission development, mm -hmm. or it's very similar. Anyway, this policy is very close to the LED. Uh, and we have several cases um, happening in the some of the area in Busan, and some of the area, area in Changwon, and also other uh, the city governments actually, actually wanted to uh, develop by the LED concept, which is very closely related to the LED. And that's funny city because we try to use more the water, um, it's just very, in a smart way and also a very efficient way. Because if you look at the expectation, uh, an expectation or projection to, to our future climate change uh, in, in 50 years, I believe, um, in, in our area, the 50 years is very short term. You know, midterm is 100 years. So, so to, I mean, try not to. Uh, yeah. But anyway, in short term production, in 50 years, which means I think 20, yeah, 10 million or more than actually the end of um, end of our century. Anyway, based on the projections, uh, we have very same day of the rain day, which means uh, we have um, this year maybe, I don't know, we have very longer uh, um, rainy days. But anyway, I mean, in average, uh, we have, we're not going to have any more than more days, and we're not going to have the last days of uh, our rain day. But our precipitation will be increased in the next 50 years, which means that uh, in one day, we're going to have more rain because the quantity is going to change, and the days will be smaller. And that means we're going to have more rain in a one day. That makes actually um, in one season. So in, in summer seasons, you're going to have a lot of rains, which means you're going to have a lot of water resources, which means we have to prepare it, we have to store it for fall or winter time. But in the winter time, we're not going to have any rain, so we're going to have, we have to prepare for the droughts. And also, I mean, we, like a lot of professors said that, I mean, we, we use, I mean, water every day. We, we have a lot of you know, water every day, 
for everyday use and also for the ecological waste and also our own waste. So uh, we, we don't we don't have any rains in the winter time and also early or springtime. So we, now we have to find another way to to you know to 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 use I mean the water resources great and I mean in an interesting way. So now we actually preparing it. You know. So we had to write uh, some recommendations. I mean, it's not just one one page of recommendation. We have to take out the studies <laughs> and just you know, a lot of the recommendations to this environment. And you have to prepare for the next two years uh, to how to use it. We have to use very smart. I mean, very smart way to use the reservoir. And we also have a very uh, like a uh, minimum built uh, the reservoir, but use the uh, you know, natural way to, uh, the reservoir. And also how to use dams. We have a lot of dyes dams, but still. How we can use it, and also how we can prepare the drought. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most of people actually think that a drought is it's not you know your problem, but it's very serious, especially drought. So uh, you know how you prepare it. So we give a lot of recommendations. It's not projections. We don't have we don't have any you know, problems in the water in fifty years. So we need to build um, you know very proper policies to. Water resources. So, in, 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 in solving, and one of the you know, things solving the way is to actually respond to respond cities because some city, and also it sees not in balance and also each does not. So, some of city has a store a lot of waters in the dispute of the other cities to who need which needs uh, water resources. So. Uh, and that's pretty very impressive work um, in, in our side, and not, which means highly and also the other side. And the other thing is um, uh, the post pandemic. Uh, post pandemic is actually uh, in touch, I mean, seriously to our work or the ones in the relation between pandemic and climate refugee. Yes, yes, it is pretty much very, I mean, Negative impact to us because um, in the, every summer we suffer from the high temperatures, especially to the you know old people and also in, in child in children and also the people who are in the hospitals. They need something to lower down the temperatures indoor and also outdoors, and also workers in the outside and construction workers. I mean, they're suffering from the high temperatures. So, so we have to provide, uh, we recommend some of policies. Okay, we have to uh, um, uh, uh, keep the, uh, the, uh, the work time now and, and work time outdoor, like uh, the two day and two hours, and then just give them 15 minutes break. Uh, in the indoor the air conditioned area, which means they have to be gathered in one place. And also air ventilation system, air control system. I mean, our government people said it could be spread all the pandemic work. So we have to stop all that implementation things. So, and then government asked us, okay, what is what is other method to to save or the lower down the temperature? We don't have one. And also we always bring um, give them advice to local people that especially for older people. Okay, they try to get in one place, which is mostly like uh, the civic centers, and then turn on the air conditioning. So um, try to you know, use that facility to lower down the temperature. So now we can right now. So, and then also the negative things, we have you know, much more larger numbers of you know, deaths, and also um, people who are sick uh, from, uh, from, from high temperatures. So I mean that, that's a lot of I mean, that's only one example of our education work. I mean we try to save our people uh, from from high temperatures, but actually the pandemic is actually very, very negative and drastically on uh, affect our work. So um, I mean we expect more study about pandemic things. Um, if you combine more creative idea about how you combine technologies and also pandemic and also adaptive things. I mean, we are actually open to take any any good ideas to, especially for 
last year, I mean, the pandemic is going to be uh, last until maybe the end of the year. So we have another summer in the next you know, two, two months. So, so please, um, please, um, you know, give us some of the ideas to, to, to prepare uh, for the next summer. And the other thing is, uh, I'm just going to focus on some of the very good things. The technologists can actually um, manage some of um, uh, uh, infrastructures and also the water resources. Uh, the base science uh, for application area is how to um, accurate or decide to project, project our climate change in the next, uh, I say, 50 or the maybe more than 100 years. And then now, how can uh, project our impact from that or it changed or projected climate change. And then we need to calculate the risk or what kind of risk risks we have based on our projected uh, climate change. And then we need data and we need current data or historical data. But we cannot measure in a fine tuning everything. So we need now depending on the technologies. So now are we trying to build AI-based monitoring system for the water resources? And also we try to use more of the ICT, ICT based uh, monitoring system for the uh, uh, for for the water uh, the water resources and also uh, the mountains, how many uh, uh, how many trees we have. Then we can calculate, you know, how many the uh, CO2 is, is, is observed or emission, something like that. So we are highly depending on uh, ICT and AI data, but still um, there's a lot of you know steps to we have to make because this is kind of very initial stage, especially for the uh, gathering data and also uh, analyzing analyzing uh, the impact of uh, uh, the data. So um, yes. Um, we pretty much um, I'm kind of looking well in the interest, but anyway, um, the, my final say is I believe so much was a landfill area, I believe, I think. And also the, the ambassador showed us um, a lot of cases of uh, the Netherlands. The Netherlands is actually a long line area. The so Songo and also Netherlands, I, I, I'm not sure about the, the, the area, but very a lot in common. <laughs> So, especially for the not whole region, but it's Songdo area. Uh, for, but I mean, students can study about a lot of Songdo, but still, if you look at um, the Netherlands cases, probably will find very, I mean, very useful um, cases and you know, policies uh, we can learn, also exchange uh, some experiences. So, I think it is very um, uh, interesting on the seminars and also. The presentation from the suspension, and also again, I'm thank you for being here. And so, thank you, thank you. And actually, my question is uh, if I may quickly summarize, you know, uh, the, the initial um, statements that you uh, we're putting together on how you know we're going to a more, much more polarized situation in which we have like a heavy rains, like an extremely high um, you know amount of rain and then extreme droughts as well. So both you know polarizations of, of our future uh, kind of uh, climate reality, as well as just uh, you know the indoor air quality. You just mentioned that as one of your adaptation strategies, right? And uh, not too long ago, I had the chance to um, participate in a seminar at Dr. Chang's um, institute, and actually, I, I, I yeah, I was pretty much impressed on, on, on what type of creative strategies they are coming up with this, you know, adaptive um, kind of uh, mindset. And actually, one of the things I, I discovered is that this pandemic, if it's, if it's something, it's definitely something you have to adapt to. You cannot just reject, forget about it, you know, it will go away, no worries. No, actually, we have to adapt it. Like, you have to adapt to it, and it seems like it's not going to be that short term. Uh, so, yeah, please, go to more comment. Yeah, quickly, I'm going to add on one thing that actually you showed me that one of the um, whole in the inside of the city, yeah. and actually after the, the one of the crisis, I guess what was it from the one of the, the disease, right? Yeah, we went through the history of pandemics yeah. so all the way from I mean, this area. I try to more focus on the climate, but but still, I mean, I'm also from the wrong planet, so maybe you have to, I mean, think about another way how we can 
we expect to change our urban uh, the living in a built environment also. Mm -hmm. And more, more actual water and electricity and water is also our natural environment, but still the human built environment could be changed mm -hmm. um, in dra in dramatically. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in the next 50 years is is not our I mean it's not our era, it's in your era. Mm -hmm. So I mean you really have to you know more you know, to work on, on that yeah. <laughs> I still remember at the very beginning when the whole pandemic started, I thought like what you know, everyone is to be on post-pandemic, post-pandemic, come on, this will be over, you know, quickly, you know, forget about, you know, I, I didn't even see the relationship between built environment or urban morphology and pandemics. No, it's not our thing. And then very quickly I realized, <laughs> wait a second, you know, you, you go back in history and actually, you know, this is a, a critical aspect. And just to tackle on your last comment on the use of technology, I think the Green New Deal in Korea is probably one of the cases in which people globally are expecting more about how to merge, you know, uh, environment and the use of uh, you know, new technologies, because Korea is popular for being you know, a highly technological advanced uh, country. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to see that uh, integration. So back to Mr. Watkins, maybe if I may, uh, just just one so second. I, everyone, I'm so pleased that you give some positive comments to my students, mm -hmm. and I do appreciate that. Yes, we do have some limitation of knowledge with me and what we both are foreigner, so we don't have much of that. Korean policies and how Korean government is doing. So I will be truly honored and glad if even Mr. Give my if even Mr. Give my students chances, maybe a small a small group like five or six in academic situations, so they can learn more. Yes, I, I do have the limitations mm -hmm. that people are coming and we don't know much of this Korean. So if they can learn some from the local institute or from an expert like you. I'm sure they are super talented. They could come up with some real ideas. Mm -hmm. Will you allow us to do that? Uh, well, I mean, definitely, we have another way to um, invite. Um, I mean, we have also have some of um, official um, um, things to uh, invite from us to the groups. Actually, from, from middle school, middle school students uh, up to graduate school students. But besides that, I mean, we, we I can always invite um, and also giving out some you know, seminars and workshops for, for our work. And also KDI, which is the Korean Environment Institute, is, um, I would say, is, uh, uh, I, I already told you that we are uh, right under the Prime Minister's office, and we are actually covering all different issues of environment, um, not, not limited to climate change. Climate change education is one of our specialized uh, topics um, dealing with, but the KEI is doing everything. So, um, and even, I mean, these things, all, we, we all do this. So, so, I mean, you can contact me, I can arrange um, any, any visit, I mean, visit or so in seminars. And also, we do have a lot of, um, lot of online meetings and also, even the online lectures mm -hmm. are yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so we do the Zoom, yeah, Zoom, so we do the so I can just, you know, link and then so we can talk. So we can talk. So we can talk. So So if I may go back to Mr. Watkins and your presentation was very wonderful, very graphic actually and I'm very much localized to our you know the most prox our proximity right our very uh, in a sound case so if I may just uh, make some kind of joke I guess one of the species that is caring less about this whole pandemic could be the migratory birds right they they probably care less about what's going on <laughs> with humans uh, you know, in the past year uh, they fly high and <laughs> definitely they have their a unique habitat. So I wonder if I know it's really like a you know like a last minute kind of thing. I mean, it's been only eight months. That means literally nothing for ecological time frames. But would you say that you know overall throughout this pandemic so far, the uh, migratory bird habitats, um, especially the ones nearby urban areas, have been so far having a break and releasing in terms of perhaps, you know, less CO2 emissions around, um, less uh, human intervention, um, maybe less noise. Uh, I don't know, it's just a, 
and perhaps it's not a scientific question, <laughs> but uh, you know, just uh, what's your perspective um, on this pandemic? Okay. Um, uh, firstly, just a comment about Sponge City. Um, China has been implementing a national policy on Sponge City for four or five years. So do, if, you know, if you're interested in Sponge City, do have a look at what's happening in, in China um, um, because they are really, uh, you know, it, it's a national policy now. So all local governments have to pay attention to the Sponge City uh, elements and, and trying to get uh, water back into the groundwater system rather than discharging it into the, uh, into the rivers. Um, pandemic, uh, migratory <laughs> birds. Um, what, a, what it reminds me of very much is, is these diseases which animals have and animals can pass to humans. And in the case of our migratory birds, avian influenza is, is the, the classic one. Um, and there you know, has been some more occurrence of avian influenza this year in, 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 uh, in Korea. Um, but this is a lot to do with animal husbandry and how we, we farm animals. And uh, as soon as you have in big densities of, of poultry, for example, then that's ideal circumstances for disease to, to, uh, to, uh, to be communicated between those animals. So in part, the issues are about our, our uh, animal management systems mm -hmm. and how we do biosecurity and how we ensure that our production systems have very strong biosecurity to, to really limit this ability for disease to exchange between uh, wild animals and domestic animals. And even within the COVID situation, you will have seen uh, the problems with mink, uh, mm -hmm. the raising of minks in Europe, uh, and these now contracting a, a version of, of, of COVID. Um, so we can anticipate, you know, this is an ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, um, issue with animal husbandry um, and biosecurity is what we have to focus on and, and, and strong uh, biosecurity. Um, now you asked me something at the start. Yeah, whether well, urban wetlands have been somehow having a release or some kind of, you know, uh, fresh air just because humans, we are, more quiet? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, possibly. I, I don't think there's much difference, mm -hmm. uh, really. Um, uh, we don't... Uh, so one of the issues here in Songdo is that we need to um, uh, create more programs to introduce you know, the importance of the area around Songdo for, for migratory birds. Um, Nandong Reservoir is an ideal one, which um, and maybe th there'll be more efforts to uh, improve public access around that site and more information about what's happening at that site. Um, but we can do a lot more with interpretation uh, materials for the tidal flats and, and being able to um, introduce to more of the, uh, more of the population of Songdo about high tide and you know, where to go and, and where to see um, all of this, in, you know, this energy from these migratory birds as they come in at high tide. So there's more for us to do with you know, introducing people to the wildlife that, that are around them. And these you know, uh, additional things that are happening here in Songdo, which at the moment um, people are not, are not aware of. Sure. Well, thank you for that. May I ask you also, uh, from your background and your experience, uh, both in Australia and globally, um, uh, have you seen anything closer to what the Korean Green New Deal aims to be? I mean, how, do you have any good, um, you know, examples of um, governmental uh, you know, approaches to um, climate um, solutions, climate actions? Um, you know, perhaps on a local level. Uh, it doesn't need to be on a national level. Uh, but maybe you know, since you have been working extensively, you know, globally and in the Australasian and region as well, and with some good case studies that we could look at, um, or, or maybe not good case study, but counter examples of what not to do. <laughs> okay, um, so I have focused a little on this issue in that Australia is a major exporter of carbon. Um, uh, 
not so much in coal for power stations, but particularly now for LNG. Um, and you know, there are issues with how we do our carbon accounting and who is the one who, who, which country is responsible for the carbon, if you like. And so we still have some major issues with how, with where the responsibility sits for the carbon emissions. And um, at the moment, it's the user of the carbon where the responsibility sits. And so if you're a big exporter of carbon, um, it doesn't create a big carbon debt for the country that's exporting. It creates the carbon debt for the countries that are burning it. And so this does cause some distortion in how things are done. And whilst, um, whilst LNG is promoted as a transition uh, uh, approach uh, to, uh, to, uh, for energy, um, uh, LNG has a, a lot of carbon emissions in, in the, uh, in the uh, during the process of of um, freezing the, the LNG and producing the LNG. Um, and you know, these, these are some of the gaps in how the carbon uh, accounting is done at the moment. Um, the other issue that we have is not only with, uh, with coal for power stations, but with coal that we use for steel production. And so this is a much uh, higher, uh, higher, um, uh, quality, <laughs> higher temperature coal, uh, which is used in steel production. And, and Australia exports a lot of that metallurgical coal to Korea and to Japan and to China for steel production. So this is another little gap area which we don't hear much about in the carbon story. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, but it, this coal is, is uh, essential for the production of, of steel. Um, so another little gap, which is clear if you are in Australia, because you can you understand what's happening. But more broadly, um, um, you know, we have some problems with with our te technology that we need to we need to deal with. Thank you. Well, before we go into more questions from the audience, I would like to you know, overuse uh, of your time, if I may. Like, you know, I was lucky enough to participate in, in some of the forums that you have been organized back in 2019 with the, some of the waterfall uh, development. Also, you know, your institution is highly collaborative. You tend to be very much open door. You collaborate with a lot of NGOs, local organizations. And, and, could you please describe, you know, that collaborative approach? I mean, I, I really think that that should be well known, not only by the Sondo population, but also, you know, a wider um, audience. Because uh, I think it's very unique. I mean, your organization, I think, has this profile that is you know, highly collaborative. And I, I've been actually enjoying that quite a lot. But I would like, if possible, just a couple of comments upon that nature. Yeah. So the, the whole nature of, of the initiative that we're the Secretariat for is about partnership. So it's about different stakeholders working together and different uh, stakeholder groups having differing responsibilities um, and, and capacities. So we are always looking for opportunities to um, to bring different groups together to share their ideas and to work towards common ends. Um, and really this partnership model is, is such an innovative way of doing things where different sectors of society can work together for common outcomes. And um, it's something which it would be great to see more of it. Um, there are lots of opportunities for other broader partnerships, even the, the issues that we've been talking about today, you need to be bringing different sectors together to, to get outcomes. Um, so you know, that's why we look to be so collaborative because of the opportunities that it develops and um, it provides the opportunity for innovation. Um, um, people are challenged with different ways of thinking and people, uh, other organizations and parts of uh, society can access new information, which previously they, they, they were unable to access. Mm -hmm. And then from that, they can um, create new ideas and new visions about, about where they would like to go. Um, 
the partnerships. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Please check out on their uh, social networks and their website, EAAFP. Um, uh, so uh, they, they, they are highly active and they, they organize a lot of interesting um, gatherings, discussions, knowledge sharing events. So yeah, keep an eye on that. And uh, say, if I may open up for questions, we have like around 10 minutes for questions, comments from the audience. We have um, you know, uh, students and professors uh, here. Uh, maybe some of you would like to comment or you know uh, share with us uh, how have you been um, digesting uh, this uh, information today? Maybe someone from the Zoom chat. Uh, it seems to be a little bit quiet, but um... question? Yeah, we have some question from the audience, please. Yeah, um, myself on uh, you keep on away from international university to study in the same area. And they even almost are doing some like work on the climate change and pollution mainly. And also yeah, this uh, you know, he wanted me to get here but a little bit like because of the MSB. And the uh, while we are having uh this kind of communication saying that you know the um you may need to have some Kind of like this, the fact about like organization but that you know, the um is the global you know it's not only for korea and even mongolia and some other countries and then you know, for the young generation you know somehow um when we're dealing with this kind of topic then just trying to um something about what's been really happening outside <coughs> and this is one thing and the second one is the um this morning I got a small video clip about climate change and then it was uh, very informative. However, at the end of the watching it, I was kind of like tired and getting sick because <laughs> we have been uh, talking and discussing about climate change response and, you know, for a while. So again, I would like to suggest you, you young, young student, um, to consider to do some real things, some practice, rather than just like uh, talking and discussing about it at the end. You know, we really, somehow no, we try not to go back to the beginning. So this might be, uh, I'm running like uh, some crazy program and some interesting institute on my campus, but this is what we are trying to do. I mean, not just for with uh, Alberta together, so I, I'm not uh, making any comment on things, but you know, the, um, why are doing things? Try to, please try to make something in real. <laughs> that might be some, uh, if I can uh, add some, and it might be funny. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. Well, definitely, Professor Lee is another highly collaborative individual. Uh, he's organizing a lot of um, intersectoral um, dialogues and conferences, and, and, and actually he's one of those people who is tired of talks, <laughs> so he wants to see some action. I don't know if our panelists have some comment on action rather than, uh, you know, talks. Uh, but um, yeah, it, it's been a thing, right? I mean, for the last, um, even the United Nations changed their way of, of um, of defining climate change and now it's climate crisis and it's, it's actually talking about climate action, right? So maybe Dr. Chan would like to move. Um, yes. Um, actually, you know, all of the government policies have a lot of you know, complaints and critics from, from citizens and also from also the academics. Um, so I'm very used to it. Um, but anyway, um, starting from next year, we are starting seven phases of adaptation, of national adaptation process. Um, the one big difference between our second phase and third phase, I mean, third phase is part of your actual growth growing plan, so uh, it's not about five years until 2025. Anyway, um, the big difference between our second phase and third phase is um, we call it as now it's all inclusive. Um, adaptation policy implementation, which means from, uh, from establishment of our policy and also implementation and also uh, evaluation, um, we have the whole, like, uh, the, the, the benefit systems. 
Anyway, we invite all the citizens and NGOs and the local government officials to involve in every system to go to our application uh, systems. But however, uh, there are some a lot of limitations to, to invite all the uh, uh, different um, stakeholders, but still, uh, now we are trying to change um, our uh, philosophy of uh, 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 government policies. Um, the other thing is we try to bring more the mainstreaming uh, con uh, of the concept of annotations. So for every decision making systems, we try to include in uh, the current change, which is the annotation. Um, we try to even give our more public awareness. So our left says, I mean, if you watch the clips of um, um, anything about climate change, it's so boring. Um, <laughs> and it's, they just talk about more the technical terms. They just you know, talk about some other uh, things, which is not closely related to our living. So uh, now we try to a more different way of uh, approaching the citizen and also other NGOs and other groups. He mentioned, you know, the work is mentioned about the published projects. We will, we will, we, 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 we would like to bring you more information, you know, more um, collaborative um, the entities in our national or international level. But still, we have a lot of things to go and we have a lot of things to develop. But still, uh, I would uh, suggest that the um, third phase will be different from our previous one, mm -hmm. but still give us uh, some advices, give us some uh, critics to our policies, then we can just um, change and develop uh, our second uh, and third phase of our uh, policies. And also, um, we're going to go back to the pandemic. Um, I think that the pandemic is also another the chance to uh, to reinstate the importance of uh, global cooperations. Uh, from climate change decide, the Paris Agreement is is a notable notable achievement of global cooperations. Before before Paris Agreement, the Kyoto Protocol is only to you know, apply to the advanced countries is given responsibility to you know, uh, um, that they try to reduce on you know, what they uh, produce already. But the Paris Agreement, now we now we know that we have worked together. But the pandemic is actually another um, the thing. We now, while we have to work together now, in one national, one citizen, we cannot solve anything. Because maybe the, the corona is coming from, uh, from one animal or the, the one vector, or still the spreading is actually migrating people. You know, I would say we can travel a lot and we're just spreading in the world. So they have to work together. So I mean this is a very um, chance to actually um, to rethink uh, the importance of global cooperation and also um, going down to see the level. So, yeah, um, I would think um, the very, uh, you know, very comments uh, about uh, the, the cooperation and also we we try. Um, so probably even that that's fine um, for all of our work, but. Um, <laughs> Patient. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the one thing you're working on. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Well, I guess it comes in the kind of Korean nature to be always demanding, right? And always like trying to look for something better. So, you know, I think I see that as a positive thing, actually. Uh, Mr. Wilkins, would you like to maybe have some any remarks on the action um, aspect of it or, or anything really that you would like to um, point out at this stage? Um, uh, really, just to say, uh, yes, anyway. sorry. I really, yeah, just to say that um, uh, reducing carbon emissions is is essential, 
Um, and even if the Green New Deal only focused on, uh, on that aspect and delivered on that aspect, that's a great return. Um, it's, it's so imperative that we, we address this issue. Um, and, uh, and even if uh, it's not very green, mm -hmm. um, we, we need it uh, no matter what. Uh, so whilst we may uh, identify you know, lots of other things that, that could be done as part of the Green New Deal, um, if, if Korea is able to significantly advance uh, uh, the reduction in its carbon emissions, then that, that will be a very great outcome. Thank you, thank you. With that positive note, that you know, no effort is a small. Um, I would like to wrap up our session today, uh, but before that, I would like to say thank you to our panelists today for staying with us until the very end of the session. Thank you to our very special um, speakers. Uh, all of you have been uh, really a uh, great asset for us. And also thank you to our students who have been working on this project, um, you know, directly. And thank you to our peer marketing department, which has been organizing this wonderful event. Uh, so a big thanks to all of you guys. You can reach us out on our uh, University of Utah Asia Campus uh, website. You can find all of our emails published there. So if you have any question or comment uh, from the Zoom audience, um, uh, feel free to, to reach us out. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend.